From CBS News Bay Area, this is the Afternoon Edition. And right now in the Afternoon Edition, breaking news, a major blow to San Francisco's struggling downtown. Macy's is closing down its massive flagship store in Union Square. Supervisor Aaron Peskin says the retail giant plans to keep the store open until the end of the year. We'll put the property up for sale. The store is a landmark here in Union Square and opened in 1947. Earlier today, Macy announced it will shut down 150 stores nationwide through 2026. It's all part of a turnaround effort the store is calling a bold new chapter. The shutdown will mark one of the biggest retail closures the city has ever seen. It also comes after Nordstrom closed its doors last year. The city also lost several small retail stores during the pandemic. Another top story at noon, we're exactly one week away from the March 5th primary and voters in San Francisco will decide on a controversial measure that will change the way police fight crime. Good afternoon, I'm Ryan Yamamoto. It is the most expensive measure in San Francisco's ballot. Prop E would give police more power to use surveillance technology, ease restrictions on car chases. Critics argue the bill would only reduce transparency, but supporters say this recent burglary in the Sunset District it is an example of why it's necessary. Police got there just as the suspects were getting away, but they could not chase them because the crime did not meet the criteria. Lauren Toms has a look at how Prop E would change that. Kira Keegan was driving this blue SUV when a police chase ended in a fiery crash on the other side of the Bay Bridge last December. Keegan wasn't the suspect, but she says the suspect crashed into her vehicle after fleeing a crime in San Francisco. And nearly three months later, getting in the car even to get to work remains a challenge. I was in a lot of shock. Um, I, I was very disoriented, uh, really couldn't process what had happened to me. The pain didn't really set in until around, you know, five minutes after, um, after I got out of my vehicle. Um, and I just wanted to see my family. The San Francisco native was lucky to walk away with minor injuries, but during her recovery, she learned about Proposition E, a ballot measure that if approved would open the door to the use of high-tech police equipment, including facial recognition software, reduce written reporting of certain incidents, and lessen the power of the police commission. It would also broaden police's chase policy to include certain misdemeanors. And for Keegan, that's what she's fighting to prevent. So it really felt like this, the police chases in San Francisco are already out of control, and I was really upset to see that they're hoping to expand them. Backed by Mayor London Breed and the police union, the proposition has gained over a million dollars in fundraising. Supporters like Police Officers Association President Tracy McRae says the measure will give the SFPD more non-lethal resources that they believe will boost public safety. People who want to commit crimes think that we're not going to chase after them or try to apprehend them. Will they feel more emboldened? To, to just commit more. We need more tools. So when we feel the pursuit has crossed that threshold to be more dangerous than, you know, maybe apprehending them at the time, it'd be nice if we could lift a drone up, right, and say, okay, they can follow. She says the measure could help combat the chronic understaffing issues that have plagued the SFPD and are currently being supplemented by millions in overtime costs. Leveling the playing field, getting tools and technology to help us because we're not pulling in people into this profession at the rate that we used to. But for Keegan, it's investments in community resources that she believes are the answer to public safety. One of the people driving the vehicle was 17 years old. I think we need to really invest in people um, to prevent people yeah. from doing bad things that hurt other people. Hopeful she can return to a feeling of safety and security in the city she strives to grow with. And a recent poll shows that Proposition E is about 61% of voter support in San Francisco, while 37% of voters do oppose it. In the meantime, it's primary day in Michigan, and President Biden is facing a big political test. That's because in Michigan, voters have the option of voting uncommitted to oppose candidates on the ballot. The president faces opposition from people critical of handling of the war between Israel and Hamas 
And in the Republican race, former President Donald Trump is expected to dominate his former U.N. ambassador, Nikki Haley. But Haley says she's not going down without a fight. Okay, first alert weather right now. More snow is expected to fall in the Sierra. Here's a look at the conditions along I-80 at Soda Springs. Let's get a sneak peek at the forecast with meteorologist Jessica Birch. All throughout the Bay Area today, we're talking about upper 50s and lower 60s for our daytime highs, some light onshore winds and clear conditions as we head into this afternoon. It looks a lot different out our windows compared to yesterday during this time when we were seeing some rain sweep throughout the Bay Area for our Monday forecast. But today's Tuesday, it's looking a lot more nice. And, you know, we actually see dry conditions into our forecast tomorrow, too. Temperatures tomorrow will be a little bit warmer than what we have right now, so we could potentially see some upper 60s up in the North Bay. But once we head into our Thursday forecast, it is a big game changer for us was we see a new system moving in, bringing in rain all throughout our Thursday forecast, Friday, Saturday, and it tapers off into Sunday. This is that system I'm talking about. It's an area of low pressure moving in from the Gulf of Alaska. It'll bring in about an inch and a half of rain on average throughout the bay from Thursday into Sunday. It's also going to be bringing in plenty of snow to the Sierra and all throughout the Pacific Northwest. It does clear up as we head into our Sunday forecast, though, and then we're left with drier conditions as we kick off early next week. Well, a young Bay Area woman attending UC Santa Cruz was strangled to death, and police say her accused killer is her boyfriend. It happened at Seabright State Beach early Friday morning. Investigators say the victim's partner and former student, 20-year-old Samuel Stone, made 911 calls, or made the 911 call. The victim's identity has not been released, but we do know the 21-year-old woman from the Bay Area was living in Santa Cruz and attending school there. And Berkeley has taken more than a half a century of battles to see this happen on the UC Berkeley campus in 1969. Students faced off with the riot police over the fate of People's Park. Now that park is lined with shipping containers at the university to took it back to finally build student housing. Our Kenny Choi reports some activists say the fight to take back People's Park, though it's far from over. The opposition to destroying the park. Longtime Berkeley resident Harvey Smith is fighting to keep People's Park in its current state. It, it's a political space, it's a recreational space. Smith is an organizer for the People's Park Historic District Advocacy Group. He attended Cal and once worked for the university, but opposes its plan to build housing on this open space. This is the University of California, fully capable of maintaining a beautiful, well kept, Park. It's just very short. Some 100 Don't park supporters it. gathered at Wheeler Hall for the first teach-in related to People's Park on the UC Berkeley campus, bringing together staff, students, and community advocates. Smith says student housing can be built elsewhere on UC property. Despite what the administration says, there is actually broad support on, on this campus for maintaining the park, and I think people understand the false choice between having to choose a park and student housing. University officials say there's an urgent need for housing and that the project will provide student housing for more than 1,100 undergraduates. It will also establish permanent supportive housing for more than 100 unhoused and people of low income. Alex Knox is executive director of Berkeley's Telegraph Business Improvement District, which fully supports the transformation. We're very excited to see it finally moving forward feeling very optimistic that it's actually going to go through. His organization recently installed planters at Dwight Triangle that's a stone's throw away from the park. Their vision is to transform it into a public gathering space. They believe keeping the park as it is doesn't serve the broader community. They didn't feel like it was um, somewhere that they were welcome to go, that they could um, really enjoy. Meanwhile, Smith is hoping to recruit more support on campus. We hope to mobilize both the teaching staff and, and more students. Uh, students have been involved from the beginning. It's an unrelenting battle as Smith's lawsuit to stop the university's project will be decided by the state Supreme Court. The university officials say the project will preserve and revitalize more than 60 percent of the site. They will say they say it will set up the public park space and create permanent commemorations of the site's history.